So let's get started. Uh, it's we're at, at time now. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in this uh, afternoon. It really is uh, great to see all of you here. Um, again, uh, I'll, I'll start off with doing some brief introductions, uh, and uh, then we'll get started. We'd really like this session to be interactive and, and you know, have, uh, have more of a time allocated for questions at the end. So with further ado, uh, I'm Alalita Sharma. I'm the uh, co-chair on the observability tag. And I've been working in the observability space for many years now. I contribute to open telemetry as well as I'm on the uh, governance committee for the project. I also uh, have been you know, involved working across uh, the Prometheus and the Open Telemetry Project on making sure that the uh, metrics protocol has been fully interoperable. And again, super happy to see you know, the collaboration we had there. Uh, and I also work in the uh, Thanos Cortex um, as well as um, other stacks across the uh, observability space. So with much further ado, again, hand it over to Bartek and then to Vijay to introduce themselves. And then we'll get started. Thank you. Amazing. So my name is Bartek Potka, uh, and I'm uh, working at Google as a senior software engineer. I'm active uh, in CNCF as a tech, tech lead for this group. And uh, um, yeah, I'm maintaining Prometheus, Thanos, um, many other open source projects. And yeah, I think in Prometheus, what's relevant, we recently are active to make sure it works with open telemetry very, very well. Um, yeah, I also wrote a book called Efficient Go. Uh, it's about Golang and optimizations. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Vijay Samuel, uh, and uh, I help lead the query language standardization uh, work group as part of the observability tag. Um, I've, I've been an active participant in the Prometheus and the open telemetry communities as well. Uh, outside of that, I uh, help run architecture for the observability platform at eBay. Let's go. All right. So um, for today, we have, again, like uh, a few slides, few content parts prepared, but we want to make sure it's interactive at the end. So let's go, go through them very quickly. We want to talk about definition of this group, what we do. Uh, we want to actually show what we do by showing our progress. We want to talk about active work groups. Um, so kind of like dedicated a group of people and focused, you know, meetings and, and work stream uh, about certain project to get it done. Uh, we talk about trends that we see uh, when we are talking with end users and, you know, vendors and how to get involved. So essentially call for action for you to help us uh, in this journey. So very quickly, what we do, that's our charter. Um, but essentially, in a simple world, we try to uh, yeah, grow the ecosystem of uh, open source observability. We want to identify gaps. So think that maybe projects that are missing in this ecosystem, maybe, uh, you know, like kind of uh, things we can improve in those projects, especially around interoperability, uh, compatibility between each other. We want to share good patterns, share knowledge about, you know, observability in general for both you know, new to observability and those who are more advanced. Um, we want to be vendor neutral. So, um, you know, we want to make sure we're, un you know, unbiased here and we are kind of like making sure you can kind of like uh, no vendor kind of like steal the whole, um, the whole ecosystem here in terms of observability. So everyone has a fair chance uh, to move around with their observability data. And finally, yeah, support projects, right? We, as you know, we have multiple ob uh, observability projects in the CNCF. Some of them are in sandbox incubated and graduated stage and they um, they just sometimes ask us for help or especially if they have to move to a different graduation um, stage we help them uh, to get there so let's talk about some accomplishments. So this year we released an uh, observability paper. Um, it's essentially an introduction to observability as we know it in the CNCF. Uh, that's the first one zero version. Uh, it, you know, 30, over 30 people help uh, writing content or reviewing. Uh, so it's, it's pretty kind of like elaborative. Um, so make sure you, you, go, you go there, um, get this, you know, readme page and, and, and walk through it. 
there is a lot of actions there, right? It's of course not, um, it has gaps, right? It has uh, some things we would like to expand more. So this is call for action for you, right? Like essentially we have our GitHub repo, just go in there, check the open issues um, and assign yourself and try to provide a content for us. We can review, we can expand this and release version 2.0. This is in progress. Uh, if you have ideas, for uh, more content that you, you read through the paper and you are missing, let us know. We'll just add it there um, and, and you know, maybe we can collaborate together on this. So, you know, everyone knows more about observability essentially as it evolves. Second thing, we, we love knowledge sharing, especially in the video format. So in our tag community meetings, we sometimes host uh, presentations. So feel free to check our YouTube channel where we essentially uh, talked about those uh, projects. For example, in the last quarter, we talked about accessibility, optimizing Prometheus, open cost, open elementary, uh, Kubernetes GPD, and where is the graph of understanding artifact composition. So um, lots of nice stuff new to me sometimes as well. And um, so feel free to join and learn especially feel free to share your knowledge about, you know, very wide spectrum of observability. We already have scheduled three more talks uh, very, very soon. Um, native histograms by Bjorn and continuous profiling from Fred Eric, Polar Signals and Proxy Awesome by uh, Wesley. So really let us know if you want to speak about that. We want to host you. We want to share your knowledge and, you know, allow community to ask, your que ask questions to you as well. Um, Later on, we also collaborate with other tags and, and, work, and, and work groups. Uh, recently, we kind of sponsored a very important cloud native AI work group, of course, and um, they actually were super fast to deliver a really, really comprehend uh, white paper as well. Um, and it's available on the CNCF page. Um, side note, we should probably make our white paper available there as well, observability one. Um, so that's my, some action item for me uh, from this week. Uh, we should uh, also mention that we are kind of trying to review the projects when that comes to a CNCF. For example, we took a look on Opal Elementary, Kubernetes GPT, logging operator, and um, yeah, it's amazing to, to see this space grow. Um, and yeah, finally, work groups. I mentioned two work, work groups. First is Observe Kubernetes. It's essentially um, our um, um, idea to kind of like make sure make, make sure to share the knowledge in interactive way. So we have a paper, we have documentation, but we would like to also show you uh, maybe a demo, maybe a tutorial that spins up multiple, let's say the biggest projects, observability projects on the Kubernetes and see how you can um, essentially observe uh, some application, which is like online boutique. Um, so thank you uh, for, you know, like so many people <laughs> were there, but definitely uh, shout out to Ken and uh, Henrik right probably more sorry but like so so many people were um, kind of like already doing this and so right now we have a demo um, that you know uses essentially contains you know metric logging traces uh, but we want to convert that to tutorial so if you want to help join this work group and we can kind of build nice tutorial that we can be you can reuse as well in your presentations in you know in, in, in your internal training so so I think it's a nice uh, nice project and VJ will tell you more about exciting stuff on querying. Thank you, Bartek. Uh, query language uh, standardization. Um, as uh, everyone is aware with the open telemetry few years ago when things on the ingest side were extremely fragmented, like-minded people came together, they put out a specification and a means for everything to converge to the point where we now have one SDK per language for all signals, and it is basically the de facto standard. Uh, a few months ago, Chris Larson uh, from Netflix and uh, myself, uh, we had uh, the conversation with the tag uh, to see how we can do something similar for the query side, because uh, the same that was for in just several years ago is still the case on the query side. There are so many languages that are there um, different kind of preferences were baked into each of the languages. Um, so we are setting ourselves uh, on the journey to figure out what these languages are, what was the reason they were built in or designed in the way that they, they were, uh, what are the commonalities that are there, how can we uh, suggest something that could be a standard on the query side as well, uh, so that uh, observability as a practice has a single way to instrument and a single way to query. So that being said, uh, uh, this past year, uh, we have actively been uh, surveying uh, several uh, 
open source projects and uh, vendor products on how the languages uh, have been um, uh, built out. And uh, shout out to everyone uh, who helped out uh, or spent time in uh, coming up with slides and uh, meeting with the working group and explaining uh, everything about the language and answer all the questions that we had. Uh, some of them are on the screen. We still have a uh, few more to go. Uh, if you are a creator of uh, an open source project that has its own query language for observability or if you uh, are a vendor uh, that has done the same uh, for the products that you own, uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to interview and collect uh, valuable feedback that you might have on how your languages came about. Um, the next step that we also want to do is to uh, empower the end users uh, to tell us about uh, their observability journey, uh, what are the ways in which they query the observability platforms uh, that they are consuming uh, right now, um, what are the pillars that they use, how they consume them for the various use cases, so that we can identify uh, patterns on, okay, these are things that are very important to end users, these are things that are not available but they really care about, uh, things like that, uh, so that we can finally go about describing um, that ideal language that, uh, uh, that we could potentially propose. Um, we welcome contributions um, uh, both on the, uh, on the creator side and on the end user side. You can find us at the Slack channel uh, that's mentioned on the slides and we meet the second and fourth Tuesdays, uh, 9 a.m. PST. Thank you. Um, yeah, off to Alalika. Okay, so um, today another topic that we want to cover. You now know all about our work groups. Uh, but, you know, this has been an area which has uh, kind of picked up steam amazingly fast in the few, last few, last year, I would say. And, and uh, it really is, you know, how leveraging understanding observability for LLMs uh, as well as uh, understanding how to use LLMs for observability. So in, in this diagram, as you see, uh, in the case of LLMs, you, which are, <clears throat> again, uh, you can use for observability to act, predict, suggest, assist, you know, with the help of an LLM in observability. Similarly, uh, LLMs can be observed, monitored, and an analyzed uh, with the observability frameworks, you know, that, that they look at, right? So, uh, that they use with. So, Again, it means different things to different people. You know, if from an observability perspective, LLMs uh, can help a lot with uh, root cause analysis. And I think we have the next slide here um, where we can, we can actually talk a little bit about the layers, but uh, whoops, should I jump no. forward? Oh, so, 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 okay. Kick it. Try it. Nice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Try it once more. And just click it fast enough. Okay, so going back to the first slide, again, I just wanted to complete my thought there that LLMs in observability are typically used for root cause triaging today in, in systems production, you know, where, where you have deployed applications in production. And you also use it for analysis because it has already come into the you know, uh, ML ops pipelines where operations does look at, you know, use LLMs now for being able to real time, you know, coalesce all the uh, alerts and the data that, you know, the telemetry data that is being generated by LLMs. And uh, similarly, uh, LLM assistance, based assistance like, you know, chatbots, are being used for uh, querying this data, right? So if you are getting, if you're running an um, uh, you know application globally, where you're running it in six regions, and you're getting data, telemetry data from all those six regions, typically an LLM is used nowadays to be able to consume that data, you know, in terms of the telemetry coming in and being able to query that for triaging and analysis. So, you know, that's a very basic case of how LLMs are used, but it, it still is something that has rolled in into ops today. 
right? And this is uh, not even without adding observability frameworks to use LLMs actively and directly. So um, uh, that's something that, again, uh, also leads to the you know, opportunity here to be able to actually adapt existing open source collection frameworks, such as open telemetry or any other Prometheus agent and other uh, you know, agent components in open source that exist in the CNCF environment or otherwise to be able to leverage LLMs for exactly you know, consuming telemetry data, understanding it, pre-aggregating, and being able to actually provide uh, standardized signal analysis as a result. So moving on, again, um, LLMs are also a new type of asset or workload, if you will, that we, we need to observe. And I ha you know, we were talking about uh, AI-enabled uh, applications in a previous talk I had, where you have different models that are being introduced weekly, some of them, and most of them are black box today, right? They're black box to observability, they're black box even to the application sometimes, but no, no, there are also models where the entire, you know, weights as well as other parameters for the model are all defined, they're actually published, and you do have some metrics that are, you know, being um, uh, released uh, or available from each layer. So in these layers, again, as applications become, are built with LLMs, the need for observing these LLMs also becomes part of understanding their behavior. And applications, you know, which included code and models traditionally, now also includes small models or large LLMs, right? And, and, and also, uh, that again leads back to the idea that for observability, you are also looking at new types of hardware, which is used for AI applications, such as GPUs, accelerators, CPUs, and other kinds of specialized uh, you know, uh, chipsets, and also model inferencing and training pipelines. So these are new assets that are coming into place but also observe, on the observability side, that framework of instrumentation as well as analysis needs to be built out in the existing you know, observability projects that exist today, which are very widely used across the industry. So moving on, again, um, some of the areas that are already being used are using LLM-based data are anomaly detection, um, tiered analysis, uh, distributed tracing comprehension, where you need to understand, you know, the, the, uh, if you have uh, hundreds of spans in a particular transaction, for example, you know, what is the general behavior going to look like, as well as data quality, root cause analysis, and, you know, also suggestions for the steps. So, Bartek, did you want to talk a little bit here about, you know, rags and why rags are not uh, enough? Don't quote me there. <laughs> but essentially, I saw, um, well, like, um, I guess, uh, yeah, like, generally, like, the, the community uh, around LLMs, especially around observability or making decisions on top of, like, uh, some data that you have available uh, are complaining on RAG, which is essentially using vector databases, right? And essentially my point is that if you want to innovate, if you want to uh, kind of like um, know what's next, is that we need better kind of ways of uh, making sure that our LLM has context of your live deployments. Because right now, the current solutions are essentially asking ChatGPT or Gemini, right, to, um, to just um, make some decision or kind of suggest some decision based on like limited context of like, you know, maybe 1,000 tokens or 10,000 tokens, which you can paste maybe, you know, I don't know, 100 of YAMLs of your deployments, right? But you literally cannot model 
are all whole architecture um, yet, right? So, and, and you know, RAG is essentially a way to kind of like maybe get this um, data upfront uh, to the LLM, but it's still not enough. So my point is like, we are still looking for ways to kind of like make it better. So please innovate, please like, it's not like somebody do this for you. There is lots of room we can improve, but yeah, essentially uh, this is what we are looking for uh, in the future of, yeah, embedding LLM with observability data. Cool. So uh, I think, you know, again, needless to say, the reason why we highlighted this space is because it's evolving very fast. And whether that's on the tool chains that exist today, or whether there'll be new tool chains that are coming in, you know, which are added for specifically, you know, understanding LLMs and being able to actually monitor, analyze, and visualize the, and correlate all across the board with other, uh, you know, layers of the system to be able to get a more holistic understanding that you usually you know, want to have from observability, there is a fair bit of work to be done there, right? And that's the opportunity where if you're an observability engineer or an ML engineer, you really can get involved in actually building out some of these features on existing projects or maybe even you know, starting a new project where you actually specialize on a certain set of models that you know, you're looking at or you understand well, and to be able to build the observability uh, instrumentation for it. So moving on, again, um, there's an, uh, we usually do this every year, and these are some of the trends that you know, we see across the observability space um, at this given point in time. And uh, again, across the industry, whether we are using LLMs or not in our applications, cost continues to be a very, very pervasive theme where uh, understanding cost and performance re uh, and of resources is super important. Because when you know, organizations are running large-scale systems, large-scale applications on cloud infrastructure, that uh, the cost optimization is, is essential, as an essential part of observability. And observability platform costs from pre-aggregation and sampling, that is data costs in itself, is an area where there are continuous improvements in terms of what does pre-aggregation do for you, right? Can you reduce the cardinality of the data you're sending over the wire? Because it costs money, right, at the end of the day. And, and it, do you turn on tracing, you know, for uh, 30 seconds uh, to, in order to get 100% traces, or, you know, do you do it for a minute? It costs money. And, and so this is a very pervasive theme in the industry in terms of continuing to optimize. And there's a couple of open source projects within the observability domain in uh, the CNCF itself, KubeCost and OpenCost. Open KubeCost is based on OpenCost. Uh, and, and these have been you know, used as just uh, foundational um, projects, if you will, or foundational components to be able to track cost, right? But as you now enter also uh, the world of smart applications, you know, that dimension changes because how do you measure costs for models, right? And is that something that has already been defined? So these are areas which are evolving, which, you know, you, uh, uh, there's a fair bit of work that is being done by hardware vendors to be able to, you know, provide some data for the resource utilization you're doing, but it's not adequate because, you know, there are lots of other moving parts in the data that is being generated, you know, for your telemetry of your applications, which also costs money when you're shipping it over the wire or whether you're storing it, how long you're storing it for, and you know, do you actually look at it uh, you know, seven days after you don't need it anymore, right? So these are many considerations that you need to keep in mind. And there's a fair bit of work happening in the industry, both from end users as well as from open source uh, engineers on the projects where some of this is being thought about. 
The other part is uh, where, you know, there's a fair bit of work happening is end-to-end -end observability, where you have, um, you know, this is not a solved problem yet. Although, you know, many, many uh, uh, pipelines have been proposed and uh, many reference architectures exist, but you still cannot say, hey, you know, I'm going to just turn this, this, this on and everything will work end to end in terms of being able to see my edge networks, my edge devices, app client applications, server side applications, infrastructure, models, as well as any, any other data that you want to see. It's not, it's not there still. Even after you know, all the work that we've all done, whether that's in open telemetry or whether that's in Prometheus or whether that is in uh, tracing or logging, right? So this is also another opportunity where there's a lot of work that is you know, ongoing, but again, our world also becomes more complex as we introduce a new generation of applications coming in. Smart applications. Uh, open telemetry is moving us in the right direction because as you can see, uh, uh, initially the project started with you know, uh, converging ingestion in under, you know, of the different telemetry uh, data under one umbrella. And uh, initially it came and started tracing, uh, then metrics, logging, and today profiling has also become the fourth signal on the project for ingestion, right? So you continue to see that convergence happening in the ingestion space. Now, why is profiling important? Because believe it or not, in the world of understanding performance and resource utilization for models, again, profiling is used a fair bit for being able to understand those layers and what you know the uh, latency is and performance is for each of those layers when they are in a model, when they are being used for uh, training or for inference pipelines, right? So again, uh, it's an interesting time in history where you're also seeing that convergence happening, but existing telemetry type signals being used for, you know, that, um, for, for these, uh, observing these new assets, if you will. And last but not least, uh, just wanted to call out that multi-tenancy is also another area that is a significant amount of work that's you know, ongoing. Uh, and what, that, what does that mean is that you know, for large-scale systems which you're building, you'd like to have multiple customers leveraging the same common infrastructure from a cost perspective. And hence, multi-tenancy, even on, in the observability data space, becomes a thing because you do want to be able to access you know, data and correlate across multiple tenants, which may be different namespaces that are belonging to a single customer, right? And a single customer could be, uh, for example, your finance you know, organization running 20 applications where they're sending telemetry for 20 applications into 20 tenants, right? And they want to be able to correlate their observability data and be able to see, hey, you know, this is the behavior of our systems at any given point in time. So multi-tenancy is actually becoming very important in the, uh, uh, in the scale of you know, the type of applications as well as the cardinality of data that is being generated by systems. So with that said, again, I think um, I'll hand it over to Bartek. Do you wanna kind of- Why continue? not, why not, I would love to. <laughs> All right, so last slide, uh, how you can get involved, right? Make sure to participate in our discussions. Um, you can do that by um, yeah, joining our calls, uh, which we have two per month. Um, make sure to just add a topic to the agenda, maybe go to our Slack channel and let us know what you would like to chat and maybe how to form this, but feel free to ask about anything. We have people essentially new to the community asking maybe questions that are kind 
kind of related to maybe Prometheus project and OpenTelemetry and, and, and Thanos and any other project and they kind of don't know where to start, feel free to ask them there. Like, it's fine. We'll direct you to the correct people. And that this is super important. Don't be shy. Uh, we, are, we are here for you. Uh, you can use our mailing list, but, but I think Slack is really good enough. Um, and yeah, really share your uh, insights and present the topic about maybe project you know about maybe problems you have about you know how you even if you didn't solve it yet you know what incidents you have you would like to have you in so please join us and thank you for coming today if no one stops us maybe you can ask some questions let me grab the microphone Anyone? Any questions? Yes. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm not familiar with the LLM uh, things. So we talk, uh, we, you talk about the model LLM for the observability. So where we can find such type thing? Where you can find the, the, the model or something available for, I don't know, to test on our data or you have to buy a vendor? So I think um, uh, it's a good question because, you know, where do I find a model that I could use for observability data, right? E even if it were out of the box. There are several uh, simple models that are available which are open source uh, and they can be used. Um, you can even use the existing chat GPT or Gemini or other, uh, you know, uh, services out of the box. But uh, typically, you know, you can just actually conf configure that. Um, in terms of being able to download models, I think uh, the references we could give are probably your Hugging Face models, the TensorFlow models, your PyTorch models, which are actually available. Uh, it depends on the number of parameters that you are, you know, interested in and where you're running these models, because again, size, uh, is uh, you know proportionally larger if you have large models, right? Large LLMs. So um, definitely, you know, these are some of the uh, projects where you can actually download the models and run them. Amazing. Any other question? Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was very very good. Um, I like the LLM part as well, even though that's not something that's being utilized that by us uh, at this point. I think we are still kind of at the point where um, I think we have a challenge of balancing resource consumption and allocation versus granularity of the data that you get out of it. Right? Like uh, you know, it's um, you increase your cardinality, you increase the amount of series and the resource usage, particularly memory, Absolutely. explodes in uh, Prometheus and in Thanos. Do you have any guidelines on how to deal with that problem, how to find the right balance? Martin, did you want to answer that for Thanos? I, th I think it's a, it's a good question. I think you should be able, we should have a solution where you specify, I want to use only, you know, let's say two terabytes of memory on my cluster and nothing more and essentially, uh, you know, let's do as maximum as, as, as possible within. Now it's a bit more manual, um, so, but I really encourage you to kind of like make it uh, data driven. So essentially, um, essentially, you know, kind of measure, benchmark, and when put on production, some portion of observability slowly increasing, right? Um, agree on certain cardinality of the metrics, agree on certain uh, volume of logs and traces. Um, see, you know, to the point where it's kind of minimally, minimally useful, uh, measure the cost of it and let's see and start from there. And, uh, you know, if it's too expensive for you, you have to essentially uh, reduce some of it, um, maybe focus on metrics more and uh, less on logs, maybe opposite, maybe actually reduce cardinality of metrics and use logs more. Um, but uh, yeah, this is what I would, what I would kind of like. Um, recommend. I wish there was more automatic solution that will help you analyze all of this. It's a good idea. Um, you need this. Okay. You need that one. <laughs> one other thing that you can probably do is like analyze your uh, query logs to see if the labels that have high cardinality are things that you're actually querying. If not, uh, some of the projects have ways to do pre-aggregation. 
or you can use the open telemetry collector to do uh, aggregations as well so that before it hits the dsdb you can uh, pre aggregate and store which is a lot cheaper yeah i mean we def uh, again in 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 several of our the solutions you know we definitely uh, pre aggregate a lot and and we are very conscious of uh, again capacity sizing ahead of time uh where you are actually very much uh sizing storage um as well as data traffic right so uh kind of going in with some uh, initial parameters you know for these numbers is always good but uh, also the percentage of you know uh, traffic that you are sending or data you are sending uh, is always proportional to the kind of amount of aggregation you are doing so you can do multi level aggregation depending on the type of metric or depending on of, on the time period right uh, uh... Thanks for the talk, and it's nice to see the tech is progressing uh, in in a year. A lot of things uh, has progressed. I, uh, about the first question part, actually, uh, we already have an open telemetry demo application in open telemetry Good repository, time. and uh, another one here. But a start point for LLMs, uh, a demo application. Uh, would be great actually uh, where we can uh, each of us yeah yeah actually uh, we were discussing this on the open telemetry demo and and we do plan to use at uh, you know kind of introduce a workflow for being able to actually do a simple model and uh, being able to trace it or uh, being able to you know uh, uh, instrument it and then publish some metrics right it would be still a playground app but still nonetheless you know ha pro does provide you insight into how you would do the instrumentation what kind of metrics are you you know looking at for the models and also uh, what translates into slas and slos for for uh, model performance because that's another uh, new area that's emerging out of that. That's great news. Uh, and the second part, uh, I have heard a lot of cost uh, word uh, throughout the conference, but uh, maybe an energy consumption uh, can be uh, also as Absolutely. fridges or uh, kitchen equipment. We have those labels. That might be nice looking at from energy perspective. Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, there's been a conversation about the tag sustainability, um, uh, working with the tag observability tag to be able to define a new sustainability taxonomy of labels so that that actually could be used as a standardized set to begin with for, you know, energy uh, uh, and performance uh, obs observability. Yeah, great presentations. I love the end user surveys, so keep up with those. I would really like to see more of those. Um, coming from the public sector, uh, we would really like to sort of <laughs> participate more with our experience. And um, documentation is really a uh, top concern, <laughs> missing documentation and, and scattered. On, on specific projects? Or? Um, open telemetry mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, sort of very... Is it on the website, or do you, do I need to dig through all of the repos? Repos, you know? yes. Yeah. I mean, so Open yeah. Telemetry, for example, which is a very large project, yeah. right? It has 80 plus repos. Um, uh, is in the process of consolidating yeah. all the documentation onto the doc site, mm. right? So you have to don't go to every repo, but rather than you can find it on opentelemetry.io yeah. slash docs. Yeah, and Prometheus is the same way. I mean, yeah. again, the documentation is centralized, and, and most large projects tend to do that. Mm. Uh, but if you see any areas, you know, where you see that, mm. you know, it could do better, definitely please yeah, yeah, let I, us know. We I, talk I, with the projects <laughs> all the time. That's great. So definitely we can, yeah. you know, work together. And, and the second thing would be more uh, use case or case studies, uh, how certain companies in different sectors implemented sort of 
all the signals and yeah. make use across of that uh, in, in their organizations, especially when they have multiple teams. I have 200 teams and 1,000 developers, so making sense of all the uh, tele telemetry is quite a challenge. Yes, but yes, absolutely. And I think to that point, I would say that the new end user tag, uh, you know, tab that is coming in now is actually uh, tasked with that initiative of uh, continuing to get in technical case studies of observability implementations, which will be, you know, again, published by the CNCF. But that's a new initiative that's actually just starting off. Well, honestly, we could kind of have some section about observability use cases, and we can essentially dig through the existing KubeCon talks and just yeah. make it in a centralized place. That's a good idea. Good so idea. Very good. I will note this down. Last two questions, maybe. Thanks again for the talk. Um, so my question is, what are some of the best practices to use LLMs for at-scale observability? Patrick, you want to take that? I can, I can take the second uh, iteration of it. At scale, I mean, that's the problem. That's what we are missing here. For example, like there was a, a good question before. Um, there is no observability specific models, right? So you have to kind of use the general model to ask, uh, you know, generic questions. To train, and, yes. And provide as much context as possible. So the best advice I have now is to choose the model that kind of, uh, yeah, is the biggest with whatever compute power you have uh, available, and um, and really try to narrow the context. Um, so essentially what exactly is happening in your cluster, what exactly scale problems you have, and uh, yeah, and go from there. But we are missing, uh, yeah, we don't have a good answer to this question, sorry. So, yeah, I mean, it's a good question, because at this point in time, there is not a standardized suggestion that, you know, we can give out of the box. But however, uh, we do plan to actually collate that together over this year because, you know, again, uh, there are several models at this point that are used for observability. It depends on, like, if you're doing anomaly detection, there are specific models that are used, uh, you know, both uh, statist statistical as well as ML models, which are very common, uh, commonly used. And, and we can certainly, you know, kind of catalog that out on the tag observability, um, you know, documentation. But um, right now, there is not any consolidated doc documentation that is available. Another to do. Thank you. Last question. Uh, I was following your work on uh, standardizing query languages. And I also heard the opinion that uh, since LLM becomes so powerful, it doesn't make much sense to standardize it because uh, learning curve is no longer a problem, so we can like generate everything and no need to learn each individual language. But on the other hand, each language is tailored to actual database, uh, so it will be more efficient. And any average standardized query language will be not that good as existing one. Can you give any um, arguments why it's wrong and like why we still need this? And uh... so I think it's a very good uh, point in time. I mean, you know, because we started the query language uh, group just you know a few months ago, and and it's really really awesome to see LLMs you know pick up steam and actually get used for um, uh, ML ops, right? So ML observability is also actually being used. So if I give you an answer that yes, it's already being done where you know multiple query languages are in the observability query language space are actually being fed to LLMs and there's one human query that is being done to you know get whatever data you want from whichever telemetry type. That is already being done. Now, what is uh, uh, the next step here is that if we could provide a reference implementation from the query language group or a reference, you know, architecture that hey, you know, you can take this kind of a model with you know these specifications and be able to uh, have a demo application available for multiple query languages. Uh, that you can download and use. That's the next step. 
I can I can add one one point to that. Uh, so yes, it is possible for each uh, project slash uh, provider to have a model that can understand their backend. But uh, from an end user perspective, uh, it's not just dashboards or ad hoc queries that you typically care about. A big portion of your observability is with recording rules and alerting rules and whatnot. So there, would you put an LLM in front of that? It would probably be something that's not very cost efficient. Uh, but rather, if you have uh, standardization, you promote uh, uh, neutrality in terms of uh, projects and uh, vendors implementing their own thing. Uh, and you're able to define your rules and alerts uh, in one way and use it across uh, any of these uh, oh, projects. Nice. Yeah, and like Alalita mentioned, like it also provides us the ability to say that, okay, you can have one base model for this uh, standardized query language that you fine tune and uh, you offer that as a mechanism for others to add weights and things like that. So there are, de there are definitely a lot of advantages to having a standardized uh, language similar to what we have for the database world. And I would like to add two things. One thing is that uh, when I was walking through the booths today or yesterday, uh, there were two vendors who, don't, who offer essentially logging and tracing metrics backend. They use PromQL for metrics, but they don't have any language for logging and traces. And I ask, why not just using something that, that is now or, um, or something that or create your own? I was like, I'm not doing this. Like, there is query standardization, how we you know kind of collaborated with Open Telemetry. Uh, they will come with something amazing. I would just, yeah, they will, people will definitely adopt it. So I'm just waiting. I'm not going to implement twice. So that's the first kind of thing that people are waiting for kind of somebody who helped define some standard language. Uh, they don't want to do that, right? Um, the second thing is that um, many of those small, uh, let's say, languages that are per project, like they are not in the general model. Like, and there's literally statement from, from some people, it's like, if ChatGPT doesn't know about this certain language, it doesn't exist for me, right? That this is where we are here um, at this point, which is could be, could be changed. Many of those maybe small project or like uh, vendors would have their own models that would help the pro with this problem. But right now, a single language can help. Uh, yeah, to like, have a one model that understand this language, for example. Yeah. And with that, really, really thank you for yeah so many questions and yeah. yeah. Thank you again. <laughs>